What's happening welcome to another edition of riot starter tv it's always a pleasure to rock with you all um i am kalanji changa for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh with my person uh, um i'm grateful to be here I'm grateful to uh to serve us i am a representative of the ftp movement that is the organization uh so i appear courtesy of the ftp movement i'm also uh you know of course uh one of the uh, founding members of Black Power Media, the platform which we're on right now. Um, so we welcome you. If it's your first time stopping through, definitely, you know, subscribe, you know, hit the like button, the bell and all that good stuff. And, um, you know, we're here with Army, People's Army, we're in the building. So definitely, uh, you know, grateful to, uh, to see you all on here. Um, today, we have a, uh, a powerful guest that we'll be bringing on shortly but just before that i want to mention our latest initiative um which is called liberation housing it's an initiative that we've put together here at the ftp movement and um you know what the what liberation housing is it is a um a program in which we are looking to make sure that our ogs and elders veterans of the movement are taken care of um so we're looking to um put together housing because so often we salute our political prisoners and we talk about our elders and our OGs and we don't look back. We don't see what's going on with them, so on and so forth. Um, I have uh, several OGs right now who are uh, ill and you know terminally ill and, and suffer from different situations when it comes to, um, you know, just being victims and and not necessarily victims but fighting against capitalism uh colonialism and imperialism so um you know i wanted to uh let you all know about that the website if you are interested in supporting the effort the natural festival.com slash liberation housing uh, that's the uh piece that you see on the screen right now okay so today <clears throat> excuse me 57 years ago uh this week we lost one of our uh, most revered freedom fighters. We lost a uh, a brother a, a, a that was seriously committed, a brother who gave us a, a clear example of what transformation looks like. Oftentimes we throw away certain people because of the fact that, you know, they don't read what we read. They don't eat what we eat. They don't think how we think. Um, they don't they're not considered for our people quote unquote so we kind of just toss them to the side and we say you know um the hell with them you know and one such brother who was known as detroit red uh is an example of 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 a person who can be transformed much like george jackson who came after him um so today what i wanted to do many of you saw the uh interview I did a few months ago with uh, Paul Lee and Peter Goldman in regards to uh, Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X and his assassination. And, you know, I was told, not that I didn't already know, but I was told and reminded that, um, you know, one of the foremost authorities on it, Haj Malik Shabazz, his life and his assassination, you know, should be on Riot Starter TV. And I'm speaking about uh, Baba Zach, Zach A. Kondo. And, for those of you who are not familiar, Zach Kondo, Baba Zach Kondo is a professor of history at Baltimore City Community College. He spent more than 31 years teaching history and black studies on the college level full time. Uh, he's in, in his 17th year at uh, Baltimore City College. Um, 
again, he's generally considered one of the foremost authorities on Malcolm X and black radicalism in the United States uh, and possibly the world. He is author of the most authoritative and controversial work on Malcolm's assassination, which happens to be Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. And he served as a consultant on several films on Malcolm, including uh, uh, Spike Lee's motion picture uh, and Malcolm X Black Sides documentary, Malcolm X Making It Plain, uh, Brother Minister, The Assassination of Malcolm X, and recently he was featured in the Netflix documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X. So we're gonna talk about a number of those things, but I wanna welcome today uh, to our platform, Baba Zach Kondo. What's happening, Baba, how you feeling? Doing well, how you doing, Baba? Hey man, I'm feeling like uh, a million bucks now I'm on screen with you. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm moving up in the world. You know? <laughs> well, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's uh, one of my great privileges. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I read a, a small portion of your bio. So um, if you don't mind, I would like you to, uh, you know, give us a, a an extended version and, and why you chose to um, pursue the, the life of uh, El Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. I mean, what, what got you into that, you know, and, and made you so passionate to get involved in that, uh, those studies? Right. Well, what I would suggest is that, you know, it was uh, probably by default more than anything else. Um, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, I was bust. I'm from Newport News, Virginia. That's okay. the... Um, uh, Hampton Roads Peninsula area, uh, Southeast, you know, Virginia. And um, my seventh grade year, we were bused to an, what had been an all white school. And so it was just us, one bus. And uh, we were all from this African, you know, I grew up in a damn near an, an all African neighborhood. Uh, we could count on one hand how many non Africans. And um, so we go to the school and they, the most blatant racist rednecks that you could imagine are teachers, they're the principal, they're the administrators at the school. And so they just discriminate against us on, on all levels. So for the first time, racism, previously racism was more subtle, but now it was blatant. And... Um, I guess you could say I was looking for a way to fight it, you know, but I was, you know, I'm, I'm 11, 12 years old. Hell, I don't know how to fight institutionalized racism like that. And so anyway, one day I'm in the, the post library. Most of us were, you know, military, you know, all of our fathers, you know, were either retired or still active duty. And I see this book called the autobiography of Malcolm X. I had heard the name Malcolm a year or two earlier and I saw this book and I, Picked it up, you know, had a picture of this mean looking brother speaking with his hand, you know, with one of his fingers like that. And it caught my attention. Anyway, make a long story short, I take the book home and mind you, I was one of those brothers that, um, you know, when it was time to do a book report, I would go into the library and find the smallest, thinnest book I could find. Hmm. <laughs> so I pulled this book off the shelf and it's 350 some pages. It's like that thing. And I started, um, I started browsing it and, um, and then I, I took it home and uh, started reading it. And for the first time really in my life, I became engrossed in, in knowledge, in, in, in studying, in understanding and it was it was basically reading Malcolm's story. I can't explain why it resonated with me, but it did. And what I could tell you is that once I read the book, and I actually read it about three times. You know, I read it, and then um, checked it out again, and then a few weeks later, I checked it out again. Um, and I really can't explain it, but. What was happening was it was raising my racial consciousness. Previously, I didn't have much of a racial consciousness. I probably had the same racial con as a typical African child, which generally in Newport News, Virginia, in the early 1970s, was you know was minute. But something started happening to me as um you know as I was reading Malcolm, and then um, 
if Malcolm talked about somebody, I wanted to know who that person was. So I, you know, so Garvey, I'd heard the name Garvey before, but I started, you know, af after Malcolm, I ended up reading the philosophy and opinions of, of, of Marcus Garvey. I read The Souls of Black Folks by Du Bois. I read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. I started reading, you know, uh, lots of books dealing with African people. Uh, and then I got on the Black Panthers after that. I, I still remember reading uh, If They Come in the Morning, uh, Angela Davis. So you could say in the seventh grade, I started developing, you know, an African Senate consciousness. Or as my family would say, you know, Zach got into that Black stuff, that African stuff. Uh, and I've basically, I've been there. I've been there ever since. Um, <laughs> You know, went to school, uh, studied history. Uh, it's, it was like I picked areas that would allow me to focus on African people, you know, directly, and then always Malcolm. So I got into Malcolm. And then one thing I'll, I'll say this, you know, um, when I was in high school, every opportunity to write a paper, it was either going to be about the Panthers or it was going to be about Malcolm. And see, mm -hmm. I was an athlete. And so I was like, you know, I was kind of like a campus celebrity. So every time I did things like that, I didn't notice at the time. I actually found out later. But it would go around the school, you know, that, you know, Zach wrote another, you know, my name was Clark then. You know, I, I heard Zach Clark wrote something about the Black Panthers parties and this and that. Or he wrote something about Malcolm X and Marcus <laughs> Garvey and, and stuff like that. So I didn't know this until, you know, I had graduated and stuff like that. And then... Another important event in all of this, um, when I was in college, uh, word started going around. Uh, I went to a school in the Shenandoah Valley, and there was about a about an hour away, there was another, you know, mountain school. And Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torre, was going to be speaking. So the Black Student Alliance at my school, you know, we decided to get one of the campus buses. Van, uh, it, it was a van. So about maybe about 10, 15 of us, you know, we rode over the mountain and listened to him speak. And so I brought my copy of his book, Black Power. And, you know, and I listened to him. And um, he said some things, you know, that really, really struck nerves for me. And one of the things, and the reason that I'm telling you this particular story, is he always referred to us as Africans. And I had never heard nobody do that. You know, you know, because, you know, when I think about Africans, I think about the continent and people on the continent. But he was talking about Africans in the United States. So he helped to push my consciousness to a higher level hmm. by doing that. And I remember riding home on the on the bus, you know, you know, making a commitment that from this point forward, I will identify myself and my people as Africans. Um, and so that was kind of like one of those watersheds, you know, right. in my, in the, in the uh, development of my consciousness as well. And then the final thing that I want to say, my senior year, um, I read an article by this journalist named Eric Norton on the assassination of Malcolm X. And that article helped to spark, because remember, you know, I've, I've always been studying Malcolm. I'd read every book by then. I'd read every book and article or anything I was on Malcolm X. If I found it, I read it. So I was pretty much on top of everything Malcolm. But this particular article, and remember, you know, I'd read stuff before that dealt with assassination. You know, there was an article in Jet Magazine and what was that published? Uh, October 1965, did that with Malcolm's assassination? So it wasn't like I hadn't been reading about Malcolm's assassination. Um, Earl Grant wrote a real, uh, you know, you know, powerful piece in Malcolm X, The Man in His Times uh, that dealt with, uh, you know, this, it was entitled the, the Last Days of Malcolm X. That dealt primarily, you know, with the assassination. It wasn't that I hadn't been dealing with the assassination, but I read this article and it forced me to ask a lot of questions. And so I tell this story to make this point. 
that was, I guess you could say, the beginning of my commitment to find out who assassinated Malcolm X. And so from that point forward, any opportunity to write research, to do research, to, you know, like e e even, even simple things. Like I I'll never forget, I did a, um, I was taking a speech class my senior year and a public speaking class. And every speech I gave, even though, you know, you're supposed to do different levels, like informative, persuasive and all of that. I never cared about what titles they gave the type of speech. Every speech I gave was a persuasive speech. And every opportunity, I talked about Malcolm X. And the last two was about Malcolm's assassination. So mm -hmm. that was basically, you know, the, you know, in many ways, that spring of my last year is when I made that commitment that I was going to focus primarily, primarily on Malcolm's assassination you know, as one of my major, you know, academic and political pursuits. Right on. They say we get involved uh, one of three ways uh, in movement and struggle, either inspiration, aspiration, or desperation. <laughs> and we can see clearly that you were inspired. And that that's a, a beautiful thing because of the fact that it, it's, it's um, we don't often um, talk about how we got to the point of where we are, you know, so we definitely appreciate you you sharing that piece. I want to, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, Malcolm, um, uh, pre nation of Islam, you know what I'm saying? Malcolm, uh, mm. the, 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 the early Malcolm, you know, in, in your studies and your research, um, what were some of the most uh, intriguing things that you found out about uh, Malcolm prior to his consciousness, quote unquote? Yeah. In some ways, I guess you could say for me anyway, Malcolm was kind of like a typical, you know, a, a typical hood, you know, you know, Malcolm, Malcolm was a hood, you know, he, he got over on people, you know, as best he could. Uh, he got involved in, you know, activities that this society would call illegal. Um, and he was about exploiting people. He didn't necessarily have much, you know, much compassion when it came to people. You know, if he had a mark, he hit that, you know, he hit that mark hard and he never really looked back, it appears, and stuff like that. Um, and I think that knowing these things about Malcolm and then his transformation, you know, as he became more spiritual, as he became more religious, as, as he became more political, I think that adds in many ways to Malcolm, you know, to the, you know, to the saga, to the uniqueness, if you will, of a Malcolm X, because you know that here's a man who 10 years earlier probably could have cut somebody's throat and kept it moving. You know, now this is the same brother, you know, whose commitment to building a nation and to African people, you know, was, you know, was on that other extreme. So I think that in many ways, I think the extremism, if you will, of a Malcolm X, you know, or, or of a Malcolm Little prior to becoming a Malcolm X, I think, I think that was always intriguing to me, you know, like, for example, dealing with white women, um, you know, Malcolm goes, you know, Malcolm Little, deals with white women, uh, has white girlfriends and white prostitutes. And, you know, part of his team were basically white, white women. But then Malcolm X, you know, one of the last groups that you would ever expect to see with Malcolm X was a white woman. And not only that, but it was, it was always ironic that a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, you know, particularly celebrities, uh, and and some you know and some civil rights leaders you know they were married to white women, and it was always in, intriguing to me. Like I remember you know um, back in the day, I remember you know reading, and don't ask me what the source was because that was a while ago. But J. A. Rogers, who I was introduced to by Malcolm X, right? Hmm. Joel Augustus, you know Rogers, you know he was a Jamaican um, historian. Right. Um, a Garveyite. Uh, I think he grew up with Garvey. Uh, certainly, without question, in my mind, one of our greatest historians, because 
very few people did the research, you know, during his lifetime that J.A. Rogers did, you know, to uncover, you know, the history of the Negro, as he referred to us before he died in the mid-1960s. But anyway, um, um, Malcolm went to see J.A. Rogers one day. And um, Jay Rogers, you know, was married to a white woman, uh, Helga. In fact, she published his books after he died. Uh, Rogers died, I think, 1965 or 1966. I think he died in, in, in 1966. But anyway, um, so when Malcolm, Malcolm apparently didn't know he was married to a white woman. So before he came to the apartment, Jay Rogers had his wife hide, you know, to hide in the closet. <laughs> and so, and so during their meeting, you know, Malcolm could hear stuff because he's later going to tell this story to Betty, right? So he hears this, you know, he he hears, you know, noisy in there and this and that. And da, 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 da. So he he knew something was going on in the closet. And I think, I think ultimately, I think she. She either either she accidentally opened it or she purposely opened it uh, because she was having a problem breathing or something like that, and so, and so Malcolm <laughs> realized, you know, that he was hiding his white wife from him. Wow! And so, and yeah, so my son in the is, closet, huh? Uh, right in the closet. <laughs> but I tell the story to me because it kind of accents in many ways the extreme levels that you find with a Malcolm X. Because remember, go for you know, you know, go backwards, you know, 10 years, you know, 15 years earlier. And Malcolm was Malcolm was J.A. Rogers and that white woman. Right. And now, you know, you got someone like a J.A. Rogers thinking so highly of a Malcolm X and thinking that him being with that white woman is, you know, would be, you know, un, you know, you know, unacceptable to a Malcolm X is willing to basically put his wife in a situation like that. And I think only someone, you know, who has went through those types of, of extremes, e even though, of course, at the time, most people didn't know that Malcolm had those types of experiences and stuff. Certainly, Jay Rogers wouldn't have known that. Probably people in the nation, because sometimes he would talk about his past and, right. and stuff like that. But Jay Rogers wouldn't know, you know, that Mal you know that you don't have to be hiding. You know, Malcolm used to be with white women, too. You know, right, you know, you right. don't have to keep your keep your woman in the uh, closet, but Malcolm had that type of persona that people like a J.A. Rogers thought it would be, you know, thought that it was appropriate to deal with him on a level like that. And I just think that in so many ways, you know, that was the that was the uniqueness, if you will, of a Malcolm X. You know, we had never really seen. A Malcolm X on that level. Yeah, we had Garvey's and we had, you know, people, you know, in that same, in the same plane. But Malcolm, you know, Malcolm was different. And I think I recognized that, you know, at a young age, you know, when I first started reading the, reading the autobiography and then after I started reading some of the other books, it was like I knew that this was something different, that Malcolm right. was something, he was something special. His level of consciousness, you know, which I think as I look back on it, it was his level of consciousness more than anything else that drew me to his story. Because I can remember, you know, when I was reading the autobiography, I can remember saying to myself and then oh, when I read Malcolm X Speaks, you know, wow, how, how come I didn't how come I, I didn't think like that? Why didn't I see that? How come I didn't have that type of sensitivity in my analysis. See, people who who force me to ask questions like that, those are the people who, you know, who who basically take me to new levels. Right. Um, if I can just share this real quick with you. Uh, absolutely. We we, okay. we honor it, brother. Rock with us. Okay. I have um as far as Africans in, in the United States, right? There are there are six watershed books that have influence and basically, you know, help to change my consciousness, you know, on different levels. One of the books, of course, was the autobiography of Malcolm X, which challenged me to start developing an, an, a more African-centered, 
you know, universe. Right. After that, I read um, a book that helped with my gender consciousness, because one of the things that I realized when I was in college is that as much as I had developed a racial consciousness, I was very undeveloped when it came to a gender consciousness. And not only that, but I really had a exploitative, you know, misogynistic in many ways, consciousness when it came to sisters, hmm. you know, because I came up viewing sisters, you know, as some, you know, as people to be conquered, you know, I mean, uh, when I was in college, you know, my, you know, my nickname, you know, me and my best friend, you know, we were, you know, and we were like roommates for about two years and stuff. Um, his nickname was the slut and my nickname was the whore. And we took pride. We took pride in that. You understand what I'm saying? I know. Being with as many sisters as we could be with. Why? Because I was undeveloped when it came to a gender consciousness. So I read Michelle Wallace's book, you know, about the black macho and the myth of the super, super woman, that thing. I read that. Um, and that book, I had some issues with it, no doubt. But that book forced me to start developing a gender consciousness. And so that was one of those watersheds, you know, it, you know, it was, you know, and, and, and it was a tough read. And, you know, she was critical of a lot of, you know, you know, African leaders, you know, including, you know, Malcolm, as far as the whole gender consciousness and stuff like that was concerned. But I listened and I read and I began to realize that I needed some work. There was some work that I had to do when it came to gender, you know, because as the black feminists said, you know, the uh, in the black feminists uh, uh, in uh, 1974, I think it was Barbara Harris, but she said that you cannot liberate half of a nation. You know, so it's like we as African men, we can't talk about liberating our people, you know, if we're putting the emphasis on liberating the African man. So all of this stuff resonated with me. And like the autobiography of Malcolm X forced me to a greater consciousness. The next important watershed for me, I read Hakeem Adabudi's Enemies, the Clash of Races. In 19, you know, uh, that came out in 1978. Very important book and particularly for someone like me where I was because what he basically you know you know he focused on you know on on you know on developing you know you know African thought to a level that I'd never really thought about before and like it was with Malcolm like it was with with uh Michelle Wallace it's like forced me to ask the question damn why didn't I think of that why did I how did I miss that Dang. Oh, man. You know, so anyway, very important. And then another book that he wrote uh, from Playing the Planet also had a similar impact, even though I don't count that as one of my what you call. Them. Then after that, I read um, Toni Morrison's book, um, Song of Solomon. Now, let me say for the record, I seldom had time for novels. You know, because to me, you know, if I got to choose between reading something that deals with something historic, something that deals with our struggle, something that deals with race or something like that over a novel, I ain't going to read no damn novel. Right. But one summer, people had recommended it. I read Song of Solomon by, by Toni Morrison. And this book was important for other reasons, too, because what it did was she reminded me that struggle needed every type of weapon that we could provide it. And that art, art could as much be a weapon, just like Hakeem Adabuti, you know, Don L. Lee taught us that in his poetry and Amir Baraka taught us that in his poetry, you know, and Sonia Sanchez taught us that in her poetry. Song of Solomon taught me that novels can be as important a weapon as a black studies book. And what this sister did in that book was, you know, she, she brought in culture, you know, she brought in religion. She brought in struggle. I mean, she was able to basically mobilize all types of areas 
you know, in order to weave this storyline. And I began to appreciate it. The significance of that book that was that it broadened in many ways my understanding of struggle. It broadened for me the importance that art and whatever you bring to the table can basically raise your consciousness. And that's what that that's what that book did. Bell Hooks, I read, uh, you know, uh, her book deal, uh, dealing with uh, what was it, killing memories, uh, you know, dealing yeah. with racism and stuff like that. And Mich what Bell Hooks did for me was she took Michelle Wallace's analysis and she added some complexities that someone like me really needed to deal with. You know, I needed to confront my own sexism. And in many ways, reading her books forced me to confront it. And not to mention the fact that her analysis, I mean, you talk about me asking the question, why didn't I think of this? You know, even her critique of capitalism took it to the next level and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you know, she, she made transition, you know, some months ago, but that was a brilliant. <laughs> Bell Hooks was a brilliant sister. That uh, the analysis that that woman gave, you know, oh man, you know, it, it just got like blew me away. Um, and then of course, Vincent Harding. Um, I read There is a River, and that book, in many ways, it changed my life. Hmm. There is a river. Um, came out in 1981. Um, that book impacted me so much that I decided that I wanted to go to the University of Denver, you know, and study under Vincent Hardy for my doctorate. Hmm. Uh, and I applied, I got accepted, all that. The only reason I ended up not going was because I didn't think he had, you know, he wasn't as enthusiastic about me coming to study with him as I was, you know, wanting to study with him. And right. then uh, my grandfather, you know, started getting sick and I knew I needed to stay on the East Coast. And so there were some other factors and stuff. But there is a river. Um, what really impacted me was his perspective. You know, he, he began the book talking, you know, you know, like he's a historian, but he puts himself into the narrative. So right. it's like his opening lines, he talks about, you know, we were doing this and that when we first saw the ships, when we talk about African people and stuff. And he know. basically carries on that type of discourse for the entire book. And when I read that book, man, it was like, wow. So, so the importance for me is that he reminded me that first off, this objectivity stuff that they try to teach you in school. You know, you know, history is supposed to be written objectively and all that. He threw that bullshit out the window. Quick. And and so I threw that bullshit out the window as well. You know, it was right. like it changed my focus because my thing was is that I'm not trying to reach some some imaginary um you know uh standard that white historians have created when it comes to to, to understanding history, to studying history, to writing history. Right. No. I'm not going to separate myself. I'm going to be part of the narrative. I'm going to speak as an African person. Right. And so that was the, you know, that was the significance for me of a Vincent Hardy. Um, you know, and that's why I wanted to study with him because previous, you know, previous, you know, people that I studied with, they were promoting that objectivity stuff. Even though white people ain't never tried to do the objectivity stuff when it right. comes to history, that was the goal that they wanted us to follow. And I couldn't, I couldn't go there, you know? So anyway, these are watershed books that kind of changed, you know, my analysis, changed my trajectory, you know, kind of like put me on the path that I've, you know, pretty much been following, you know, for, you know, for damn near 50 years or so. Right on. I, I appreciate um, you sharing that because of the fact that, you know, we're usually hearing about the propaganda used against us. Folks don't talk about what motivates us. What are some of the uh, tools? And I think that even when you talk about books, oftentimes we, we get caught up in like, oh, that, that, that did it for you or that motivated you or this, so on and so forth. 
before you have a fire, there's a spark. And I think that we got to always remember that. I, I don't care if uh, Franklin at Charlie Brown table motivated <laughs> you. You know what I'm saying? Him being the only <laughs> black boy on the, at the table. You know, whatever it takes to get you to where it is you need to go is what's important. We get caught up in, in absolutes. And yeah. the reality is there are no absolutes. And once we realize that there are no absolutes, except for the fact that uh, capitalism is absolutely uh, inherently evil, uh, imperialism, Zionism, colonialism, etc. You know what I'm saying? But until we, we get clear on that, then we'll get, uh, you know, will be engaging in the sidetracking of the slave um you know so so definitely um i appreciate you giving us that meat because of the fact that there's someone that's checking it out now right yeah Bob, if i just vessel back though the yes. question that you were asking me in reference to malcolm one mm -hmm. of the things though that i think you know really impressed me about malcolm x to kind of go back to the question in reference to you know prior to him being Malcolm consciously, you know, when he was basically Malcolm Little and basically a hood and stuff, is that Malcolm also taught us a valuable lesson that, you know, it's okay to be where you are, to go to the, you know, through the experiences that you go through, so long as you're able to utilize those experiences to, in other words, you know, it's okay for you to, um, you know, to have to deal with lemons as right. long as you can figure out a way to turn that, you know, to turn those lemons into lemonade. And right. I think that to me was one of the, one of the most unique features of a Malcolm X, you know, right. is that he could go through those experiences, but what did he do with those experiences? He ended up using those experiences in order to improve himself in order to improve his knowledge, in order to provide more understanding and more grounding in the things that he had to deal with in the future and stuff like that. And the other thing is that, and he never apologized for his background. You know, Malcolm's, I think, I think the honesty in Malcolm's autobiography, that is he basically giving you his story, but he's not trying to chocolate coat it. Most people say right. sugar coat, I say right. Right. Chocolate coat, but he's not trying to chocolate coat it, you know. He's telling you as he remembered it, you know. He may have taken, you know, here and here and there some poetic license here and there, but for the most yeah. part, he's giving you an accurate portrait of how he saw his universe, how he saw his life, and he wasn't trying to apologize, he wasn't trying to lighten the blow or make himself come out looking better and stuff. That's self-criticism. And I think that self-criticism was one of the other valuable lessons that I learned from Malcolm's life, you know, right. is that it's right. okay to be able to look yourself in the mirror and see what's there instead of just seeing what you hope to be there. You know, Malcolm could do that and, you know, he could self-reflect and more importantly, he could learn from the self-reflection and therefore help you to learn from the self-reflection and stuff. So those were some of the things that, you know, th that I think helped explain why, why Malcolm, why I was drawn to Malcolm more than I was drawn to say some other people, you know, who I read, who I studied. Let me, let me ask you this because, mm -hmm. uh, because you, you, you definitely, you know, your point is, is on target uh, because so many of us, you know, Malcolm has been like, you know, to many of us, we have, um, uh, Garvey as the the, the 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 great grandfather, and Malcolm as the grandfather, and the Panthers as you know as as the 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 the, the grandmothers and grandfathers, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, it, it is through that 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 self criticism you talked about that gave us a a inroad, a a, a light uh, down the tunnel, because you know so many of us have gone down the quote unquote wrong path, but most Africans you talk to that, that, that are involved in any type of uh, revolutionary work, particularly nationalists or pan-Africanists, they mentioned Malcolm because of the fact that, you know, he was, like I said, he, he was, he was the, the man with the, as Imam Jamil Alameen, formerly H. Rap Brown would say, the man with the muscle in his voice, 
He had the ability to command, um, you know, respect just based off of his, 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 his being, you know, his existence. Um, how important to you in, in, in your mind, uh, how important was it for there to be a Detroit Red? Because again, we went from Malcolm Little and, you know, we, they talk about how his parents were Garveyites and his father's role, so on and so forth. And then Detroit Red, it's like, you know, it's this ugly spot and stain where, you know, oh, he messed with white women. He, he, he was involved in drugs. He was a petty thief uh, for all practical purposes. He was a parasite. But how important for was it for there to be a Detroit Red? Right. I think I think it was vital for the man that Malcolm became, that he went through all of the different levels you know, of challenges, you know, that he went through. And think about it. It gave him, you know, it broadened in so many ways his perspective. It gave him experiences that down the road he could tap, he could tap into. But it also gave him a language. You know, like he talks about this in the, I think in the chapter 1965, in the autobiography, he talks about how, his experiences equipped him to be able to walk down the street in Harlem and hear, you know, you know, listen to what people are saying and be able to understand it, be able to appreciate it, be able to, you know, to, you know, to know what they're saying versus some other civil rights leaders at the time who walking down there, they would need a translator. You know, right. Malcolm never needed a translator when it came to talking to his people, particularly urbanite, you know, you know, urban, urban Africans, right because that is, you know, you know, you know, th that is his universe. That's, that's where he came from. And so it gave Malcolm experiences. It gave Malcolm resources, for example, that a Martin Luther King, you know, who was raised middle-class, you know, would have never been able to, you know, to, to necessarily experience but Malcolm experienced it. And it reminds me of an African proverb. Um, only he who has crossed the river can say that the crocodile has a lump on its snout. That's right. Only he who has crossed the river can say that the crocodile has a lump on its snout. Malcolm could talk about that crocodile's snout, whereas a lot of other people, because they didn't have those experiences, they couldn't. He could also talk about, like, for example, you know, when Malcolm talked about some of the, you know, some of the urban explosions, you know, in the United States, you know, during the 1960s and stuff, he always talked to you from the perspective of the African who is basically in the middle of it, the African who is facilitating it because he understood their anger. He understood their experiences. Very few leaders of that era looked at it like that. In fact, most of our leaders, they looked at it from the standpoints of the enemy. You know, we're, you know, in there, you know, we're being violent to our own communities and all this. Like, you're going to break that, you know, all the, you know, like you know all, all of the crime. progress yeah. we've made right, is going right. to be transformed because of what y'all are doing in the streets and all that stuff. Malcolm understood his anger. Malcolm's thing was we got to figure out ways to redirect it but that that anger is legitimate. That's right. That, you know, that those thoughts, you know, that those actions, they are legitimate and stuff. But see, other leaders, they couldn't do that. So, no, to go back to your question, you know, yeah, uh, those experiences equipped him. And I think, think about this. I think this is one of the reasons why we do hold Malcolm in, you know, in, in, in many ways in greater esteem because we know where he came from. We sure. know that he went from these different levels and that along the way, we also know Malcolm was a scholar. You right. know, Malcolm was constantly, constantly feeding his mind. You know, Malcolm knew that the mind is a muscle and you got to exercise that muscle to maximize it. And so Malcolm's constantly, so he got all these experiences, you know, you know, you know, as, as the book said, he rose from hoodlum, thief, dope, pet, la pimp. He got all these experiences and at the same time, you know, Malcolm could go and have, you know, conversations, you know, with the most elites of the 
elites. So all of these things in many ways made Malcolm special. It made Malcolm more unique, you know, than, you know, than the vast majority of our other, you know, leaders and stuff because of these experiences. So, yeah, yeah. but he needed those experiences. And I think that without those experiences, you know, without Detroit Reds, uh, I don't think we would have had a Malcolm X. You know, we needed those experiences for there to be a Malcolm X. That's right. And, and I love the fact that uh, you're pointing out basically that uh, not only did Malcolm have his finger on the post of the streets, because so many of our, our quote unquote uh, activists and freedom fighters now to this very day, they don't have their finger on the post of the streets. They don't know what's going on in the community. They don't go to the hood. They never been to the hood, so on and so forth, but are quick to come up with town hall meetings and do all these different virtual meetings about what should happen and what what the people in the community need so on and so forth and they don't really touch down in the hood they go to the safest of spots one thing about detroit red he uh before even becoming malcolm he had uh or and even after becoming malcolm he had what we call a hood pass many of us can go anywhere <laughs> around the world right you know by ourselves and we we, we good not because of the fact that you tough not because you look in no certain way, but your spirit and your energy uh, uh, lets people know and reminds them that you belong wherever you are. You know what I'm saying? And that that that's a uh, that was a powerful uh, attribute with with Malcolm. But I, yeah, but um, I want to talk about uh, the the death of Detroit Red and the resurrection of Malcolm. Because when we talk about Malcolm, I think that most people forget that uh, he was Detroit Red longer than he was Malcolm. He was Malcolm Little in Detroit Red longer than he was Malcolm. Um, you're talking about he joined the Nation of Islam or was introduced to the Nation of Islam when he was in prison. What was that, like 54, uh, 56? Was that? No, uh, no, no, earlier. Earlier than that. Earlier than that. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, uh, let me see. He was uh, probably around 50, 51-ish. 51. Okay. So he's assassinated in, in 65. Mm -hmm. So for all practical purposes, we're talking about 14 years of becoming Malcolm and, and becoming the man who we know him at, no, know him as, to, no, excuse me, the man he is today, the man we recognize today, in 14 short years out of his 39-year span. You know what I'm saying? He, mm -hmm. he was able to become that. Um, I, I want to, you know, what was that impact and, and what was your, uh, um, how important, shall I say, and I know this question may sound basic, but how, in, how important was the Nation of Islam's um, teachings when it came to Malcolm or or the, the, the influence? How, how important was that when it came to right. yeah. you know, the um, building of it? Right. I think that the Nation of Islam, uh, it was it was significant. Uh, it was vital. I think it, you know, it was it was timely. Malcolm and the nation happened at a very crucial time, but at a very necessary time. And I've always been clear on the fact that Malcolm needed the nation to the same extent that the nation needed someone like a Malcolm. Right. And it was a powerful, a powerful marriage, you know, when it lasted. And let's be real clear, you know, Malcolm, you know, and I talk about this in my book, Malcolm needed Elijah Muhammad's wisdom. He needed Elijah Muhammad's experience. He needed Elijah Muhammad's teachings. He needed Elijah Muhammad's mentorship and his paternalism. Malcolm needed all of that to the same, you know, and to the same extent, the nation needed Malcolm's youth. The nation needed Malcolm's diligence. The nations needed Malcolm's, you know, hold no prisoners mentality that, hey, we should have a thousand more. I'm going to make sure we get 
a thousand more. They needed that type of confidence. They needed someone who could articulate, you know, who could take some of Elijah Muhammad, because let's be honest, Elijah Muhammad wasn't the most articulate speaker, nor was he the, you know, the best writer. You know, you know, sometimes it was a struggle reading Elijah, you know, Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm helped to correct some of those deficiencies, some of those, def you know, some of those defects. And so it was an incredible marriage, an incredible marriage, um, you know, while, while it lasted, you know, and both of them, they fed off each other. Both of them needed each other. One without the other, we would not have had a Malcolm and an Elijah. But the two feeding off of each other, we had a Malcolm and we had an Elijah. You know, that was, you know, and, 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 and let's be clear, you cannot separate the person who became Malcolm X from the nation of Islam. You know, that was a marriage and it had to happen. And we're playing with history. It would be ahistorical to try to figure out, well, what if Malcolm hadn't hooked up with Elijah Muhammad? Or what if Elijah Muhammad hadn't hooked up with Malcolm? Where would blah, 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 blah. That's right. an intellectual debate. You know, are we just no wasting sense. our time. Right, right. So right. no, this needed, it needed to happen. And you cannot minimize, you cannot minimize the marriage between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm and the nation of, of Islam and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. You can't, you can't minimize it. And I think in the interest of our people, it was good that it happened. We needed that relationship to happen. And it was for the betterment. The tragedy of all of this was how that relationship ended. That's the tragedy. Right know. on. You know, and right. that's the that's the atrocity in all of this. Right on. Let, let's let's wrap about uh, international Malcolm. Um, you know, one one beautiful thing is I think he took um, he took a page from folks like Paul Robeson's book, uh, being able to go abroad and get a clearer understanding. Of, of the workings of the world because you you he moved from uh I, I dare to say encapsulated situation to a more broader thinking situation i remember listening to um uh some audio about uh, uh when he was talking about how he would listen to how he got his speaking style, his speaking pattern from Paul Robeson. He talked about how he would uh, sit in a cell for hours and listen to Paul Robeson. And he, uh, uh, to a degree, mimicked his speaking style. Do you, did you, uh, do you speak anything on that? Or, you know, or is it something that I'm just. I'm no, not... actually, I'm, uh, I don't, I don't recall that, but, but okay. that's okay, Baba. You know, you know, I would, I would I would certainly trust you on that. Right on. And, it, and and I'm trying to think because it was long ago. I'm not sure if it was actually me hearing him say that or someone uh it was I, I remember it was something on the radio and it was a long talk about it. So I I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't want right. to And see know. for a question like that, see that would be the type of question that I would have to defer to brother Paul oh, Lee cuz right right Paul would be able to tap into pull it. that one up without right on. without jumping through no hoops and stuff like that. Whereas somebody like me, you know, and, and and particularly as I've gotten a little bit older and stuff, I would have to, I would really have to do a little research on that one. Hey, I, I respect it. You see, I, I I like to uh I like to be clear and shout out to uh brother Paul Lee um and uh Peter Goldman uh for folks who missed that particular episode uh, a few months ago. We talked about the assassination of Malcolm and uh, a little bit more of his history and, and, and uh, Peter Goldman's meeting him and interviewing him and Paul's extensive research. And Paul, of course, speaks highly of Baba Zach Kondo. And he says that the book you wrote was, uh, you know, is probably the, mo the foremost 
uh, the best research. I don't want to jack his words up because I don't want no problems with Brother Paul. But uh, but definitely, you know, he he uh, you know, he suggested strongly urged uh, me to interview you uh, a while back. So definitely shout out to uh, to them. Um, I yeah, want to. Uh, and let me just yeah. uh, let me just say this too. Um, just just in case Paul is listening to <laughs> yes <laughs> that um as I shared with you you know Paul Lee is the most meticulous um the most uh, skilled scholar and mm. researcher uh that I've had the pleasure and I've hooked up with a lot of our you know scholars and researchers uh that I've ever had the the pleasure right. of um of working with you know, and he made me a more meticulous, a more sensitive, a more detailed oriented scholar. You know, when I was working on my Malcolm X book, you know, because he, you know, he, he would willingly, you know, share information and we were exchanging documents and FBI in particular and stuff like that. So it, it was a it was a great collaboration when I was working on the Malcolm X uh, assassination and he made it a much better a much better book because he forced me to be more sensitive, you know, in my, in my research. So I, I just wanted to just say that publicly. Right on. And I, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you saying that because of the fact that, I mean, you know, when, I mean, just to get Paul Lee and, and Peter on, on the screen uh, together or separately was, man, it was, it was like looking for the two fairy. You know, so, uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, definitely, you know, he's, you know, I, I've learned a lot from him in, in our short uh, time communicating and, and just the, the emails, so on and so forth. But, yeah. um, yeah, uh, so definitely. And you know what? Uh, let me say this, too, about uh, Peter, Peter Goldman. You know, I, I, I'm i critical of Peter Goldman in my Malcolm X book, you know, which I'm in the process, by the way, of uh, revising and hopefully it'll be ready by this summer. You know, right I've been on. adding some stuff and it's. You know, trying to be meticulous, like like my brother, you know, Paul be, be insisted and stuff. Man, it, you know, it, it, it shit takes a lot of time. So let me just say that for the record. But you know, I quoted Peter Bell, uh, 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 Peter Goldman more than more than anybody else, hmm. um, in my book. But it wasn't all critical quotes. You know, like like for example, when when Peter talked about. Um, you know, the impact that Mecca had on Malcolm X. I always thought, you know, I I quoted that in my book because I thought that he penetrated it to the essence, you know, because basically he said that, you know, that basically Malcolm buried the devil in Mecca and that white people henceforth simply became no longer the devil. They simply became the enemy. I mean, that is a very perceptive assessment and a penetrating assessment of Malcolm's, you know, con you know, uh, of the impact of, of, uh, of, uh, you know, Mecca. And so I also quoted, you know, Peter on those levels too. So I'm saying that to say that, you know, I appreciate the research of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of uh, Peter, even though we came from two different perspectives, you know, he came from the perspective of a white liberal, you know, right. when he wrote his, his first, you know, few editions, and I came from the perspective, you know, of a black nationalist, of a pan Africanist, of what Hakim Adabuti calls a liberated intellectual. So we were definitely gonna, you know, bump heads, you know, right. and he came from perspective then of really, you know, thinking that the system worked, that these white detectives and these white cops and the FBI, when they interviewed him, that they were be on the level and stuff, whereas I'm coming from the standpoint that they're lying their asses off and you right. can't trust none of them. Right. You know, he, so he, those he, are just some of the some of the simplistic differences and stuff. Right on. No, and that and, and I'm glad that you said that too, because you know, folks, when, when you say the whole the, the white man's the devil, right? Uh I tell tell folks all the time, man, um, you know, I don't think that the white man's the devil because I don't think that uh the devil got anything on the white man. You know <laughs> the devil's overrated and the white man's underrated so i don't i don't think you know i don't so <laughs> i can agree with you on that um you know so we we can all get to get together on that one um on the international level you know how important was that the, the, those travels because again we, we talk about these stages and these levels and 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 i'm asking these questions because you know some folks think they know 
And, you know, so I, I want to go to folks who, you know, I, I want to tap into yours and, and, and what's your thoughts based on your research and what was the most intriguing thing that you found about his traveling during your research? Okay. Well, first off, I think that Malcolm's travels, you know, were quite significant, even though maybe not on, uh, not in the way that, that most people, particularly those who are limited to the autobiography think, um, you know, like for example, um, this notion that Malcolm goes to Mecca in April 1964 and he realizes that white people can come, you know, that Muslims of all this and all that. It's like people forget that in July 1959, Malcolm went to Mecca. Now, he didn't make Hodge, but he went yeah. to Mecca. You know, th there was very little that Malcolm hadn't seen in 1959. Um that he saw in 1964. So I don't necessarily buy into, you know, too much of that, you know, how he, how shocked and, you know, and uh, the new world opened up and all that. I, I think Malcolm was much more schooled than that. Malcolm was much more uh, experienced and seasoned to know that white people could go in to, to Mecca and that he didn't need to go in 1964 to figure basically, you know, figure that out. Right. But to me, what I always found most significant about Malcolm's travels in 1964, you know, was that it did open up a new world as far as Africa's concerned, as far as the Islamic world is concerned. You know, it basically introduced Malcolm to the extent that he had experiences, you know, particularly on the continent, that he had never, you know, that he had never had before. Yeah. And so I think that broadened Malcolm's scope. And particularly as he met with different leaders, you know, particularly the African leaders on the political level, because remember this, when, you know, in my studies of Malcolm, my primary focus was on the political side of his travel because those were the sides that are going to contribute to his assassination. And so I was particularly, for example, interested when he met with Nkrumah, you know, when he met with Sekou Toure, you know, when he met with African leaders who, you know, he was trying to promote his UN, you know, project with, and, you know, what some of their responses were. Because one thing is clear, none of them signed on you know, to be the sponsor of his UN project. Right. So, so obviously, you know, even some of the African leaders um, who you thought would be, would have been the most interested, maybe, maybe they considered it, maybe they pondered it, but certainly by the time of Malcolm's death, they had made no commitment to do that. And I think that there was, you know, on that level, I think that there were some disappointments if you will, on Malcolm's part, you know, in that he looked to African leaders as basically having the back of Africans in the diaspora and specifically Africans in the United States. And I think that the record seems to be clear that, you know, he was he was disappointed, um, particularly when it came to people who he would talk about previously, you know, as if they were, you know, you know, obviously they were on his pedestal. Like, for example, I, I think Kenyatta, disappointed Malcolm, hmm. you know, you know, quite a bit. Um, you know, when he was there during his stay, I think as Malcolm began to see the role that he was letting, you know, Brits play in his government, just different things like that. I think, I think one of the significant things for a Malcolm X going to Africa in 1964 is that it, it, it opened up, if you will, it opened up his perspective to the degree that he began to get a more realistic portrait of the role that colonialism was still playing in Africa, you know, mm -hmm. even in those countries that he, you know, that he had the most hope in, you know, colonialism was still alive and well, or I guess it was neocolonialism, but it's alive and well. And I think that all those things, you know, forced Malcolm to take another take, you know, on, you know, on what is needed, if you will, to empower Africa, you know, from the 60s 
from the 60s, 40s, you know, I mean, forward, you know, so, you know, um, and, and so I think that was very important for Malcolm's education. Sure. Um, you know, and we always, we always want and need our leaders, you know, to continue their education, right. you know, and obviously I'm not talking about that school. I'm not talking about school bullshit. I'm talking about education as far as life, as far as politics, as far as culture, you know, we always want our leaders to grow. And I think, you know, going, you know, because remember, Malcolm was in Africa and Asia for 24 weeks in 1964. You know, that's most of the year. Right. And so he's going to be equipped with some experiences, you know, that I guess the tragedy is, is that he's not going to live long enough or too much beyond those experiences so that he could have utilized them more as far as our struggle, as far as our knowledge, as far as taking us where we need to go. He just didn't have that much time, you know? And so we could speculate, you know, had Malcolm lived, you know, how would those experiences have influenced this or influenced that or taken him here or taken him there? You know, it's not much we can do with that, you know, at this stage, but clearly, you know, clearly going, oh, and then the other thing that I always thought was important, Malcolm went to Africa. Not all of our leaders That's right. focus on Africa. In fact, particularly with the civil rights leaders, you know, you could hear some of them, you know, and they're talking about Europe right. the way they should be talking about Africa. So Malcolm understood when a lot of others didn't that it had to be Africa. Africa had to be front seat. Right. Now, because he was Muslim, you know, he still, you know, had his flirtation, if you will, you know, with the Islamic world, even though I think that going to the Islamic world also helped Malcolm, you know, giving him a more realistic portrait, for example, of how Arabs dealt with Africans, you know, in the Islamic world and stuff like that. He needed those experiences as well, because I think in the end, Malcolm came to see, you know, that Sunni Islam, you know, just like white Christianity had its contradictions, had its racial, had its cultural, um, you know, injustices. And I think that that was something that Malcolm needed to know as well. Right on. Um, I, I think that it's also important to note that, you know, just naming some of the heads, heads of state that you talked about, um, and Krumah, uh, and even folks like Castro, uh, the fact that Malcolm was, was accepted and given an audience, uh, by these heads of states and he wasn't a head of state himself is that, that, that's a, that's a feat. Of course, we see later on, you know, uh, Minister Huey P. Newton and Eldridge and folks like that uh, <laughs> following that lead and that tradition. But the, I mean, and, and and not only that, the majority of these leaders were, were so young. We're talking about Patrice Lumumba being 36 when he was assassinated. You know what I mean? You're talking about Malcolm being 39 and Martin being 39 and and uh, uh, France Fanon transitioning at 36 and, and just so many others who never made it, um, uh, che, uh, che Guevara, what, 39 years old, so on and so forth. You know, so we're talking about, for all practical purposes, youth. You know what I mean? You're talking about, I mean, the majority of us, you know, I, I have children in, 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 in their 30s. You know what I mean? So the majority right. of us these days, we don't even, you know, I, I would argue that you don't even truly enter manhood to about 40 years old. You know what I'm saying? You're a man, you get an understanding, you're clear about certain things, but as you grow, you know. So, you know, Malcolm has hadn't even made that full transition. And we can't, again, it it it, it would be asinine to, to speculate on whether or not, you know, where would he be today and would Malcolm be for voting all, all the other craziness. I mean, it, that's just as insane as hell to me when people talk like that. But, you know, just remembering uh, the age and, and, and the fact we talked about, you know, him being into, quote unquote, consciousness of being on the right side of things for 14 years. Um, I want to um, 
Let me say one thing, though, Baba. Yes, to kind of vegetable back on something you were saying. Okay. When Malcolm was in some of the countries, um, he was treated like he was a head of state. Right. And 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 not only that, but he was given the types of perks and resources like a chauffeur and bodyguards and different things like that when he was in several several countries. Uh they did it. Uh, for example, Sacred Torre comes to mind off the top of my head. You know, he gave Malcolm actually, I think he gave Malcolm two security people. Um, I think one was an officer. Uh, he let him stay at Malcolm's uh, villa. Uh, I mean, excuse me, at, at uh, his villa. Uh, he gave him a chauffeur. Right. He basically, you know, he gave him a chef. He gave Malcolm the type of respect that would have normally been reserved for a head of state. And I think that to me, the significance of that is that even though not all of the leaders and, and um, uh, Faisal did the same thing in uh, Saudi Arabia, not all of the leaders, you know, clearly viewed Malcolm, you know, as a head of state, but it's real clear that, you know, when he was outside of this country, you know, some of these leaders had a very high, opinion of him and where he was at that stage, you know, in his life. And then the other thing too, is that this, this whole youth thing, I think that um, we really underestimate, you know, how some of these, you know, like, you know, because we would assume that people like some of the giants that you named, we would assume that they were older than their years um, simply because of who they were, how they carried themselves, the what they had accomplished yeah. and stuff like right. that. Right. But you're right. You know, we're talking about in the larger scheme of things, these men were babies. Right. And yet, you know, and yet to I be where they giants. were. At, right. Yeah, right. And unfortunately for pretty much all of them, you know, they never went past those, you know, those, that whole 30, you know, the whole 40 mark. They never, right. they never yeah, made sure. it. And, and of course, it forces us to just marvel. Imagine if this brother or that brother, you know, had lived longer. What else could we have expected and stuff like that? But no, that's, that's an important right. point. Right. No, no, no doubt. No doubt. Now, it, it, it brings me, brings Chairman Fred to mind as well. You know, 21 years old, you know. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and we talk about you know and and George Jackson, twenty nine. We th these are, are folks who you know we revere, and and that is why we we say um, elders for counsel, youth for war. It doesn't mean that 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 you know the the youth are being dismissed. It means that you know oftentimes you played this game already. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know the play. You know you know where they're gonna come from. You know what time they're gonna throw the water. You know what time. You know what I'm saying? You know what, right. what the hits feel like. You know you fresh on the field. You ain't never got hit before. You know you get that concussion. You might quit. You know what I'm saying? But this this what come with the game. This what come with sport. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you need uh you need you need the elders for advice. I want to um talk about um uh, about your your, your book. Uh, conspiracies unraveling the assassination of Malcolm X. What prompted you to write it? And uh, give us a uh, you know a synopsis of of you know what what is it? What you know why why should folks check that out? I mean you know I mean Mary, uh, uh, Manning Marable has a book. Why why don't we read that one? I'm just messing with you. Uh, <laughs> let, let let's talk about your book. We're gonna touch on Manning as well, by the way. But okay, um, now. Correct me if I'm wrong. When we were talking about when I read that the, the Norton article, was that when we were off the air or on the air? Uh were we I, on the air? You know, I, I think I think you I think you might have been off the air. I think you was off the air, if, if I'm not mistaken. But it is it's not gonna hurt. You just go on into it and uh but okay. I, I think I think it was off the air, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. So well, what had happened was in my senior year. In college, I read a uh, article right. uh, by Eric Norton that dealt with the assassination of Malcolm X, and it, you know, and remember, I had already, you know, read different things about Malcolm's assassination, but you know, but reading this article for some reason, something happened, 
and what it was, I have no idea. All I can tell you is after I read that article, I started thinking more seriously about figuring out, you know, trying to resolve this question because it was real clear that at that stage, we really didn't know who really killed Malcolm. You know, yeah, we had people in prison and all of that. We had the official version and all of that, but it just seemed like it was more complex than that. And that's what that Eric Norton article reminded me of. So all I can tell you is that starting that spring in my senior year, I started allocating time and resources looking into Malcolm's assassination. And every opportunity when I was in classes, you know, I used, you know, I don't care what the class was. When I was in school, I would try to gear it all toward something that interests me as an African person, know. you know? Uh, so, you know, you know, it might be a PE class to somebody, damn it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to weave in my history or African people or Malcolm or somebody into that class if I got a project to do. And so that's what started happening. Um, in speech class, I started, you know, dealing with Malcolm's assassination and political science classes and social science classes. And so when I graduated, I knew that that's what I wanted to study when I went to the next level, when I went to grad school. So when I went to, to grad school, and let me just share this, because I don't, I don't know if I've ever been talking about this publicly, but a watershed for me, okay, my, um, I was uh, taking a class uh, in, um, and I decided that I was going to write uh, a, a seminar paper. It, it was a seminar history class. Uh, and I, I said I was going to do it on Malcolm's assassination. So I ended up writing this 36 page um, seminar paper on Malcolm's assassination. And I tapped quite a bit from Eric Norton and a few other, you know, articles and books that I have been reading and stuff like that. And so I decided after that paper that I was going to use that paper would be the foundation for my thesis, that this is what I wanted to study for my major project, you know, in my, in my program. And so I went to a conference, me and two other brothers, we went to a conference. This was in 1983. Um, it was the, uh, the regional conference in Chicago for the National Council for Black Studies. And I went to this conference and it was like a who's who of black study pioneers of serious scholars and stuff. And I got an opportunity to meet a lot of them. And what ended up happening was when I would talk to people, I would tell them that I'm writing, you know, a thesis on Malcolm's assassination. Uh, and I remember talking to some people and I had a few, there was an instance where there was a line of about two or three brothers. And, and these are serious brothers waiting to talk to me so that they can give me some type of direction because they knew through this person or that person or overheard this or that, that I was doing this thing on Malcolm X. And I'm talking about people who... I had a notebook and I was constantly writing down stuff. They were giving me people to talk to, you know, like people that I remember, uh, Leonard Jeffries was there and he's going to put me in contact with, um, uh, let me see. He put me in contact with James Smalls who put me in contact with, with Ella, you know, Malcolm's sister, Ella Collins. Uh, I talked to uh, Baraka, uh, oh, James Turner was particularly helpful for me. He gave me names and phone numbers of people who I needed to talk to. You need to talk to Gil Nobles. I will give you, hold on, I'll give you his phone number. Tell him that I told him, you know, told you to call him. You know, you need to talk to, uh, oh, oh, what was that brother that did the Malcolm and Martin? Uh, Woody, uh, for some reason, I want to say Woody Strode, but you know, Woody Strode was an actor, former athlete and stuff. So it's not right, Woody right. Strode. Woody right. King, you know. It was like I got names for all these, you know, people to talk to, you know, and a couple of people who were at the Audubon, you know. I I got names from from these other, you know, from these older seasoned scholars and stuff, because their thing was 
we want to make sure that we give you good direction. It was, it, it, it was like they mentored me in the beginnings, you know, by giving me, you know, by kind of opening it up and giving me direction and stuff and saying, use my name. You know, when right. you contact them, feel free to say, I gave them the number to call you and stuff like that. So anyway, that was a very important um, episode, you know, in my, in my studies, because in many ways, you know, that, that kind of got me started. And, and so after that, I made a special trip to go to New York, uh, to go to New York. One of the good things is that, you know, when I was in grad school, I had, a, I had scholarships that basically gave me money monthly, you know, after all my bills and stuff were paid. And, and so it gave me resources that a lot of grad students didn't have. So they used to have this airlines called People's Express. Wow. And it, it flew out of Dulles Airport in D.C. And I would drive up to Dulles Airport. In those days, People Express cost $19 to yeah. fly from Dulles, you know, which is Northern Virginia, you know, the DC area right. to Newark. Wow. $19. $19. And then it went Did up. They had you on the wing years. or what? Huh? They had you on the wing or what was going on? <laughs> $19. But, was, <laughs> but you know what? But it was cool. Uh, yeah. And so I did that several times during my research on Malcolm. I would fly to New York. I had relatives in New York. I always had places to stay and stuff. And I would spend like a day or two uh, sometimes going to stores. Like, I never forget. I went to this store. In those days, they were still selling tapes. You know, the little cassette tapes. Cassette tapes right. I would go into a store where, they, where you could hear them playing tapes like Malcolm X and, you know, different people like that. I would go in there just hoping that maybe somebody there could give me some direction because obviously there's some, you know, obviously they're selling these things and they, you know, it's political. Right. They're selling Malcolm Jax tapes and stuff. I went to this one time, one time, it was a brother named James Payne. He owned the place and he listened, you know, I, I was talking to him and, you know, told him what I was trying to do. He listened to me. And then, you know, I, I come to find out that he was at the assassination of Malcolm X. Wow. Um, one thing though, that I did learn real quickly People would test you. They wanted to make sure that you were who you said you were. That's right. Um, because, you know, and, you know, and it's based on experience because, you know, we've had enemies of our people who have played games with us. So they want to make sure before they open up any types of can of worms. So I had to kind of get used to that at first. You know, because they're going to test you and they want to know. And how do I know what you say? If I call this person, what are they going to say to me? Blah, 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 blah. Stuff like that. So these are just some of the things that I learned, you know, as a, you know, as a neophyte, you know, researcher, you know, because I ain't learned none of this stuff when I was in school. You know, I had to learn this stuff on my own. Um, and then the other thing that I also remember, there was a brother. Um, they were already, okay. Um they were already going to the Audubon, I mean, uh, to, to the Franklin Cemetery, you know, for, you know, Malcolm's, you know, commemoration. And Ella told me this story. I know about four people told me this story, so I'm pretty sure it was pretty accurate. But this is the story that they told me. And this was their way of saying to me, you be careful, young brother. They said that there was a young brother. They said he was about 17, 16, 17 years old. And they said that when they were at the Ferncliff Cemetery on Malcolm's birthday, I want to say in the early 70s, like maybe 70, 71, something like that. They said this young brother, um, he, he pledged that he would not rest until Malcolm's killers were found. And they said he took some type of like a silver bullet or some type of bullet and he put it on the gravesite. And, you know, and he did this in front of people. And what they told me was like shortly after that, this brother was found shot. Hmm. And keep, keep, keep this in mind now, we're talking about the early 70s. Malcolm's killers are still across the river in Newark. Hmm. Now, 
Is there a connection? Do I know anything about? I don't have nothing on nothing. I can't even tell you the brother's name. They couldn't, they don't remember the brother's name either. But they told me the story because they wanted me to be careful. Like, don't get it twisted. It's real. Exactly. You know, right. that what right. you, and what they were basically saying to me was what you're embarking upon is not to be taken lightly. And well, it seemed like you're a serious young brother. So you need to make sure you carry your, you know, you cover your back. That's what I got mm. from this. And, you know, in line with this, um, I never forget. Oh, and I was still doing, you know, my Malcolm research, but the book hadn't come out yet. Right. I never forget one night I get a phone call and it's a uh, Leonard Jeffries, you know, at city college. Right. Now. And so this was probably around, I want to say this was probably around 91, 92. And at that stage of the game, I was already being criticized by, you know, some of the people in the nation, you know, you know, some of the, the local ministers here and stuff like that. You know, so I was, you know, I was, you know, they'd be selling whoop tickets, you know, about, you know, they knew that my book was going to be coming out soon and he's going to try to argue that the nation killed Malcolm and, you know, all that type of stuff. Plus, I had given lectures and been on radio and stuff like that. So they kind of like knew I was out there. So I get a phone call from Leonard Jeffries and it was probably around 1130. So, you know, it was kind of like late. And I get this phone call and he says, uh, you know, uh, Brother Zach, this is, uh, you know, this is Lynn Jeffries. How you doing? I said, I'm, I'm good. What's up? He said that they had been hearing stuff in New York. And this is the nationalist pan-African community that they had been hearing stuff that the nation was going to move on me. Hmm. And he wanted to make sure that I was okay. Well, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't heard anything or anything like that, but you know, and everything was cool. But here's the thing though, the fact that I had to get phone calls like that, the fact that there was ideals floating like right. that, even if it's right. just a rumor and stuff, we should never have put ourselves, I'm talking about we as African people, shouldn't have never put ourselves in a situation in which thoughts like that had to be considered, had to be right. on somebody's radar, the possibility that, you know, because I'm researching, you know, one of our own, we got, you know, we got groups who have problems with that and might want to do something to me type of stuff. You know, that's that's the ultimate contradiction in this whole Malcolm thing is that, you know, is that we, you know, have groups that go after our own, but not necessarily the enemy. You know, that contradiction, yeah. you know, it still bothers, it still bothers me, that contradiction. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and we appreciate you, Shannon. And shout out to Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We had him um on riot starter tv last month so if you all have missed the dr leonard jeffries interview make sure you go back uh in the archives either go to blackpowermedia.org uh and check that out or you can um you know go on the black power media uh youtube thing i just wanted to plug dr jeffries i think he just turned uh 86 or 87 years old uh last month so uh, Good definitely brother. yeah Good definitely brother. shout out to him Yes, yes, yes. And I'm trying to get uh, Professor Small on as well because of the fact that uh, we definitely appreciate his work. Um, I want to, you know, because, you know, you've been you've been talking about, the, you know, the, the pink elephant in the room, as they say, or some people say the white elephant in the room. So I, I'm going to just jump into it um, from your research and your studies. Uh, point blank period. Who killed Malcolm? Who assassinated Malcolm X? Yeah. Um. As an organization on the orders of Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam were the killers of Malcolm X. Uh, they were egged on, they were manipulated, they were schemed on by the FBI, but it was the Nation of Islam on Elijah Muhammad's orders that killed Malcolm X. And also we need to throw in the, the New York City Police Department and their you know, Red Squad, as they were called, their secret, you know, intelligence unit known as BALSI, the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation, they lent a hand. And and the short of things is, is that the enemy of our people, mainly the FBI, 
They knew that there was tension between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm and the family of Elijah Muhammad. And what our enemies did was they simply exploited those weaknesses. And mm -hmm. then ultimately they let nature take its course. They exploited it as much as they needed to. And then the nation picked up Basically, you know, you know, you know, picked up the, you know, picked up the reins from that point forward and then did what they ultimately did. And let me say this, less pain. Now, when I did my book in 1993, you know, my hope was, you know, there was still some people that I really had wanted to talk to who could shed some light on Malcolm's assassination. So my hope was after I published my book, was that some some other people, you know, with the energy and with the commitment, you know, like, you know, you know, with the commitment of a Zach Kondo and a Paul Lee, that they would then step in and kind of like take it to the next level, find some people who wanted to talk, maybe some of the old guard, they're dying, they're sick, they're willing to talk. And we didn't really see that up until a few years ago when Les Payne's book came out. Les Payne was able to do what I was not able to do. He found a couple insiders who were willing to talk. And two, well, three, three in particular. Two of them were people who periodically have said things over the years, but never to the extent that they told Les Payne. And we need to put it in context. When they talked to Les Payne, they were dying. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Yosef Shaw, who we knew as Captain Joseph Gavitz. And I'm talking about, you know, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Jeremiah Shabazz, who we do as Jeremiah Pugh. Pugh had been the, uh, he was the minister of the um, Atlanta Mosque, where y'all are. And then he became Mosque number 12, the uh, Philadelphia Mosque, you know, which is the the, uh, probably the most gangster of all of, you know, Newark and Philly were the most gangster of all of the NOI mosque. Wow. Um, and so basically both of them talked to pain. And then he also had a person who was part of the goon squad that that was the group that ultimately had the responsibility of killing Malcolm. Uh, roughly it was a group of around 20 men and the assassins came out of that crew. Mm -hmm. They were all FOI Newark, Moss number 25. So Payne was able to talk to both Pew and Captain Joseph when they were on their deathbeds. They had both been protecting Malcolm, I mean, excuse me, protecting Elijah for the most part for the last, what was the, uh, up until that time, let me see, uh, Jeremiah died in 1990, 98, Captain Joseph died in 1993. Now so up until those times, both of them were basically covering Elijah back. They might say, hey, look, the nation, you know, participated, but they would always keep the distance from Elijah Muhammad. Well, on their deathbeds, neither one of them were basically saying that. They were basically saying, that the orders came from Chicago, you know, the orders came from Chicago. Joseph even, uh, you know, even though he, I think he had admitted this on the interview that he did with Spike too, that, that uh, members of his squad bombed Malcolm's house the week mm -hmm. before he was killed. Wow. Um, but then when he's on his deathbed, he tells Les Payne, and, 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 and I think, you know, I, uh, respect less pain. I don't, you know, he ain't making this stuff up. And basically, he he basically Joseph came clean, and he admitted that the nation not only bombed his house, but you know, but that they, but that they killed Malcolm. And Pew basically did the same thing. Pew also explained how Farrakhan ended up at Newark, and you know, on the day of the assassination. And I think that that's his story. You know that that you can basically bank on that. You know, he basically said that, um, because everybody knows, well, if you don't know, Farrakhan spoke at Newark that afternoon, you know, pretty much about the same time that Michael was being killed. Wow. Um, 
Oh, no, 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 no. It was later. Let me see. Malcolm was killed around three. He, had, he, he hadn't spoken that. He spoke that evening. But here's the thing. Um, and I talk about this in my, you know, in my book. I talk about how the FBI, you know, launched an investigation to try to explain how it was that Lewis in the early morning of the assassination got up and drove from Boston to Newark. And they were trying to figure out, is there a connection between Malcolm's assassination and, you know, Lewis being in Newark? Well, Furcon had over the years given different reasons as to why he spoke at Newark. You know, first he says, Elijah Muhammad, uh, you know, that uh, at the time, Ma Seven had had a permanent minister. And so Elijah Muhammad was, was basically rotating people. Uh, and so it was his term for the rotation. Of course, the only problem with that, though, is that he couldn't, I, he couldn't notify his people that he was going to be gone because he got that, you know, he got the notice from Elijah Muhammad, like, real, you know, like at the last moment. You understand what I'm saying? So obviously that wasn't, he wasn't scheduled to speak there, mm. obviously. Mm. But according to, to uh, Jeremiah, what Jeremiah basically said was, he said basically that Elijah Muhammad was a Machiavellian and that people didn't know how political he was and how much he schemed. Mm. And he said that members of the high command of the nation still didn't trust Farrakhan because they thought that he was too close to Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And that what, according to, to, to Pew, according to Jeremiah, what Elijah Muhammad was doing was he ordered Lewis to Newark to speak because he wanted to bloody Lewis's hands. Meaning he sent him to Newark at the base of operation. Because remember, that day, the assassins, basically, the base of operation was the Newark Mosque. And mm -hmm. so the major officials who are participating in Malcolm's assassination, they're all assembled at the Newark Mosque. And that's what Farrakhan and four bodyguards are. So when they're making, when phone calls are being made and everything, and in fact, the assassins, according to the plan, they were supposed to go into the, into the Audubon, slaughter Malcolm, escape using the crowd, and then make their way back to the Newark Mosque to be debriefed. That's what the, that was the overall strategy or, or framework for the assassination. Well, that's where the only one assassin will ultimately make it back that evening. And that's going to be Bradley who fired the shotgun. Mm. You know, and but Lewis is right there. So according to Jeremiah, what Lewis is do, what what Elijah Muhammad is doing is he's bloody and he's forcing Farrakhan to be a player in this, whether he wants to or not. Mm. And that's what Jeremiah's thing was. He said, Y'all don't know Elijah Muhammad. That's how his mind worked. You know, he was he was basically tying. Farrakhan to Malcolm's assassination so that in the future, if he ever reached a point where he wants to come clean, he's going to have to explain why he himself is right there and he's not doing nothing to stop this thing from happening. To nobody did he say, hey, y'all, this ain't right, y'all. Let's stop this. So he's tying Farrakhan's hands. That's the story that Jeremiah told um. Uh, Let's paint on his deathbed, and I think that you know there's no reason to doubt any aspect of that story. Wow. And it goes along with everything else that we already knew that I'd already talked about in my book, anyway. You know, and that is that, that now one other thing that was important about Les Payne's book that I learned, you know, that I learned to help put more things in perspective. There was a conference that took place. Now, let me just say this for the record. When I was doing my research, you know, thanks to, thanks to Paul's, um, you know, organization, I got an opportunity to interview Wilfred. 
Malcolm's oldest brother. Right. Okay. So I I flew up to Detroit, you know, stayed with Paul, you know, spent the day with Wilfred. And Wilfred talked to, you know, he told us about an incident. Uh, he couldn't remember where it was. That's what I remember about it. But he said that that he remembers Elijah Muhammad saying to, you know, and it was it, it was a gathering of, you know, ministers, captains, and, you know, FOIs, you know, maybe some lieutenants. He didn't know. He was kind of, you know, fuzzy. But this is what he remembered. And, and this is what I remember from my notes, looking at my notes from, from, from the interview. He said that Elijah Muhammad said that he hoped to see Malcolm's children begging for bread in the streets. Wow. But he didn't know where, you know, what the, you know, where that happened. Well, one of the things that Les Payne talks about, he talks about a meeting again that I didn't know about. Okay. But it, it took place in September in Michigan. And that at this meeting, which Jeremiah facilitated, at this particular meeting, um, uh, Elijah Muhammad told it, it was a it was a meeting of ministers and captains, FOI, and Elijah Muhammad stated to his flock that he wanted them to do bodily harm, uh, fate. What, what, what was the term? Fatal bodily harm to Malcolm X. And what I'm starting to realize is I'm, re uh, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure, and I probably probably want to talk to Paul about this because if anybody, you know, would would have some, it would probably be Paul. But I'm trying to figure out whether or not that possibly was the meeting that Wilfred was talking about. Mm -hmm. Remember, Wilfred was still in the nation during this time period. He was a Detroit minister, uh, mm -hmm. and so all that to say that pain, I think has become that person that I was hoping for who could then take our understanding to the next level as far as Malcolm's assassination is concerned. And I think that he has, you know, just with those things, just those three things right there, I think, uh, have really enhanced our understanding of Malcolm's assassination and basically has pretty much added, um, you know, more, more substance you know, to my thesis, um, you know, you know, in in the first edition of my book. Do, do you know when uh, Wilfred actually left the nation? Uh, Wilfred, I want to say he was gone uh, again. Paul would know specifically. I know he was gone by 68. He was definitely gone by 68. So he stayed even mm -hmm. three years after the assassination. Yeah, he stayed a, a little while after the assassin. And then he he said that he just kind of gradually kind of kind of eased eased on out the door. So do you think it was fear, uh, or just uh, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? As far as him staying that that length of time, right? I, I I think that that for the most part, I think I think Wilfred was just kind of like biding his time. I I think that had he left right away, I right don't think time. that you know I, I don't think he he probably trusted the, you know, the nation at that stage and stuff. I, I think probably for safety reasons. And so I think that he just kind of gradually kind of eased on, he just kind of gradually eased on out the board, door. I think Philbert, I think, stayed longer. Mm. And remember, Philbert let himself be used by them. Like, you know, he, he went before the cameras and talked about Malcolm being mentally ill and all, you know. Philbert would pretty much say whatever that yeah. they needed him to say. You know, he, he was used. Wilford didn't didn't go that route. And, and it, it appears that they respected him enough to not try to force force Wilford's hand right. to just jump on in there. And remember, they were secretively meeting periodically, Malcolm and Wilford. Right. You know, I mean, they still had a relationship that if a lot of Muhammad and them knew about it, you know, that would have been, you know, very detrimental, I think, for Wilford. Because they would have probably viewed Wilfred maybe as a traitor or something, you know, as right. a hypocrite, which is how they helped to justify Malcolm's killing. He was a hypocrite, mm. you know. So, so it, no, it, it's a horrible story. Malcolm's assassination is a horrible story, and I tell you something else is horrible too. They got this 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 new guard, you know, of the nation. Now, in my 
in the book that I got coming out, I have a small little message for Farrakhan in which I'm calling on Farrakhan as a leader of African people to just basically just come clean and let's stop, you know, let's shut that spigot off. You know, like there's this new thing going on now. Like I was uh, listening to uh, 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 Nelson, um, uh, Carl Nelson. On his show, one at, at different times last year, he had on Akbar Muhammad and he had Wesley Muhammad. And they're all making these arguments now that um, – Raymond Woods revelations, you know, about the NYPD, you know, participating in assassination and all that. They're using that now to argue that that because of what Woods is saying, it proves that the nation ain't had nothing to do with Malcolm's assassination. Huh? Right. So we got a race trader who makes a couple statements offering us very little substance, by the way. But the nation is using that now. I think even somebody even wrote a book uh, in reference to this. So, uh, oh, so uh, didn't we kill Malcolm or something like that? But it's like they're still playing these games. Malcolm's been dead for over 50 something years, and they're still trying to come up with ways to make it seem as though the nation were victims. And by the way, that's what. That's what came out on, on the Carl Nelson show. It was like they were trying to make this argument. Um, uh, I think Carl Nelson asked, uh, was it Akbar? Yeah, he asked Akbar when he was interviewing him uh, after the whole Woods thing. Well, has anybody apologized to y'all for accusing y'all of killing Malcolm? So it's like a race trader connects the NYPD, which I'd already done in my book anyway, to Malcolm's assassination. And that's proof that the nation was innocent of Malcolm's assassination. So let's ignore everything that the FOI did. Let's ignore everything that a lot of Muhammad said. Let's ignore everything that Muhammad Speak said. Let's ignore all those attempts on Malcolm's life in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Boston, in Philadelphia, in New York. Let's ignore all of those things because Raymond Wood said that the NYPD had something to do with Malcolm's assassination. So everything that the nation did, apparently, just like a magic wand or something being waved, that's the proof that they had nothing Raymond Woods proves that the nation had nothing to do with Malcolm's assassination. This is unbelievable logic or lack thereof logic. But that's what they're arguing right now. Mm -hmm. So my thing right, you know, so my thing in, in this next edition is I have a message from Farrakhan. You can come forward finally and lay the record straight. By all means, Feel free to talk about my research on Malcolm's, you know, from the FBI and all that type of stuff. You know, certainly we can tie them into it, but the nation has to accept its responsibility after 50 something years. At what stage can we lay this to rest? Farrakhan knows, he knows that the nation killed Malcolm X. Hmm. He knows some of the members of the team that killed Malcolm X. He knows that Elijah Muhammad was in the forefront of the assassination of Malcolm X. And the national leadership was in the forefront of the assassination. He knows all of this. Let's lay this to rest once and for all. Instead of bringing up a new generation of, 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 of scholars in the nation who are going to try to perpetuate this thing that, hey, the nation ain't had nothing to do with my assassination. The government was all the government and blah, 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 blah. We got to be better than this. You know, like, uh, who was that? Cummings used to always say that, you know, uh, Elijah Cummings before he died. We, we, we're we better than this. We got to be better than this. We can't have another generation coming up with this facade. I think you, I think you're the first person on this show to um, 
to quote Elijah Cummins, but we're gonna go ahead and <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, we gonna give you that today. But uh, <laughs> um yeah, so let me ask you this. I mean, before I go to the next question, I want to ask you, I mean, you know, you wrote this book, you know, uh man, almost three decades ago, correct? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 29 years. 29? Yep, 29 years. It'd it be 30 years in next next year. 30 years. So have you had, um, I mean, you know, because of the fact that, you know, as, as, as some viewers would say that that's a bold, that's a bold talk you're talking, Baba, uh, 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 Baba Zach. Um, have you had any issues? Have you had any, you know, has there any been, been any types of, uh, repercussions and you know yeah, what I'm saying? mostly mostly you know i mean people have have sold wolf tickets there's been intimidation type of stuff i'll never forget um i gave a lecture one time this is had the book come out yet i don't remember you know it's like 30 years ago but so i don't know if the book had come out i think the book had come out yeah it had come out i gave a lecture at newark mm. um <clears throat> in newark Okay. In Newark, wow. right? Okay, yeah. and it, it was like a standing room only. It was like at the I want to say it was at the library or something, but they had it, you know, like standing room only, basically. And half of the audience were were Moss Twenty Five, hmm. right? And the minister was there too, the minister at Moss Number Twenty Five, and they kind of, you know, and they were kind of like they were masked toward the the front of of the building so i'm speaking and within five five feet wow. because the chairs were real close you know like there was a small platform and then there were chairs right right below the platform and stuff and so you know it was like a real strong show of force right. you know from the nation i was sponsored by the malcolm x grassroots uh movement they had sponsored. Mm, okay. Okay. So, and you know, and I, you know, I, I stayed on point. You know, I talked about Moss Twenty Five. I talked about the FBI. I talked about Elijah Muhammad. You know, and um, I, I wasn't sure where things were going. I did have a security. I, I did have a small security force. You know, that was kind of there. You know, representing the, um, you know, the Malcolm X grassroots, you know, movement and stuff. You know yeah. who who had sponsored me, but anyway, but but this is what was good. The minister, um, the minister asked a series of questions that I was happy to answer, and they were reasonable questions. And it was obvious that he was a thinker, so he's processing them. You know, he, he would ask me a question, I process it. He said, "Okay, thank you, brother." He asked me another question and stuff like that. And then he asked me at the end, his last question was, so, so let me ask you something, brother. What would you recommend that the nation do right now for us to try to resolve this whole, you know, he, it was like a question like that. And I gave him, you know, you know, like I, I thought first you got to come clean and, you know, our community, I think we'll understand and, you know, let's get everything out in the open also let the nation you know you know since farrakhan has taken over the nation he's the gatekeeper now of its legacy so uh, you know since everybody else is gone he has to you know you know you know he has to basically accept the responsibility for it and stuff so i just talked about stuff like that and i just remember the brother was sitting there taking notes and being being very respectful and see to me that's the type of dialogue that we need to get past this, mm. you know? And so, you know, after that, I thought, I always thought that the energy, you know, of the room changed after that, you know, because I think initially it was to intimidate me. Right. And that's why they're all over, you know, all up on the stage and all that type of stuff. But I think in the end, you know, it was about, you know, reasonably trying to move forward from this point. And that's right. the way I basically interpret it. I've been in other cases, you know, like I, I think some of y'all have seen that thing. Uh, I don't know if, if, if it's still on YouTube, but when me and Conrad, Conrad Muhammad, and they they had a walkout. I don't know. I don't know if you can see it on the film, but this was in 1995. This was like the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Malcolm's assassination. And while I'm speaking, they have a, 
they have a walkout, like three rows of the MGT, you know, the, you know, the uh, girls training program. They get up, you know, while I'm speaking and they turn and then they foul out, you know, one line after another line. It took like 10 minutes of my presentation, you know, so I just kind of, you know, stopped for a minute and just let them kind of like walk out. But it was like, what the hell was that? Now, later they're going to say that because I was talking about Elijah Muhammad, they didn't know if something was going to happen and they wanted to protect the women and all this type of stuff. But to me, they were just, it was, it was just a scheme. It, it was just playing a silly game instead of just confronting the reality. And that's what we're going to need to do. We need to simply confront the reality. And then, hey, look, let's take our blows where we made mistakes. Let's take our blows because that's the first step in healing. You know, just take your blows. Yeah, you had people back then. And in fact, technically, you can even disassociate yourself because that was a whole different generation back then, you know disassociate yourself. But look, back then, that's the mentality. Back then, that's how things happen. It's a simple equation and stuff. But you first got to be willing to accept responsibility. And if you're constantly teaching generation after generation after generation that you didn't kill Malcolm, even though periodically, though, Farrakhan has implied that Zealots, I think is the term he likes to use, that it's possible that some zealots may have participated in Malcolm said, No, he knows damn well it's worse than that. It, it wasn't just zealots. These were rank and file people that he himself knows because he was at the station of operations during the actual assassination. So just come clean. Farrakhan is almost 90, he's almost 90 years old. If not now, when? It is time. We need to lay this to rest. And, and to be honest with you, Farrakhan really is the only person who can lay this to rest because he's the common denominator. You know, he was there then. He's still there now. Almost everybody else, they're dead. They're ancestors. They're dead. Farrakhan is that link between the past and now. He's the link between the old nation that killed Malcolm and the current nation that he is basically, that he has resurrected. He is the person more qualified than anybody else to finally set the record straight. And that is what I'm hoping for. That's why I'm, you know, revising and will put my book out. Again, I'm hoping that it will, you know, help to resolve first and first and foremost pressing questions that I wasn't able to finish, you know, to resolve initially. But more than that, I'm also hoping that it will serve as a spark, if you will, for Farrakhan to finally set the record straight. Hey, Baba, you 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 use busting so many shots. I'm like, you know, I mean, my the, the my my earphones you know, is, is, is popping right now. Um, so we, we definitely appreciate that. I got a couple more questions before I let you go because I know you have things to do as well. Um, first yeah, off, I need to I, I need to pick up my baby daughter from high school. I'm, I'm good for about uh, 20 more minutes. That's all we need. You know okay. what I'm saying? We, we already got it measured out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's all good. Um, for, for folks who are just tuning in, you're checking out uh, – B Baba Zach Kondo. Baba Zach Kondo is a author, scholar, and um, uh, an a, a authority on the assassination of El Hajj Malik Shabazz, known as Malcolm X. And we're honored to have him here today. If it's your first time tuning in to Black Power Media, make sure you subscribe. And for folks who are checking it out and appreciate what you've heard so far, please be sure to share this video because of the fact that it needs to be seen and needs to be heard. I want to. Um, you know, recently, I believe in November, uh, <clears throat> Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam was exonerated. I, I wanted to know your, your thoughts on exoneration and, um, you know, j just your thoughts on that. And then the second part of that particular question is um, you were involved in the film Who Killed Malcolm X. So I want to know your thoughts on both of those particular pieces and, you know, run it from there if that's cool. Okay. Well, let me deal with your first question first. Um, 
I actually interviewed both, uh, um, you know, Butler and Johnson, um, Aziz and uh, Khalil, um, when I was doing my research. And I I was actually impressed by both of them. And of course, you know, I argue in my book that they didn't no more kill Malcolm than I did. And I was about five years old, I think, when Malcolm, when Malcolm was killed. So certainly, you know, I, I, I certainly am, you know, somebody who uh, appreciated, you know, as racist as the judicial system is, uh, as corrupt as the, uh, you know, criminal justice system is, it was good that they, but remember now, and this is just a technical issue, they didn't exonerate them. What that court order basically did, it, what they did was they vacated the, you know, they, fa they vacated the judgment that basically found them guilty. Exoneration, and this is just a legal technical thing, that would have required something, something different. And in fact, what they said, if you read the what's called, you know, the actual order, what they basically say is that they're not going to even address the issue of whether or not the men were guilty mm -hmm. or innocent. They said what they will address is all of the procedural and substantive actions that took place during the trial and the investigation that had they been done properly would have been favorable to the two defendants. So that's what their ruling revolves around. But anyway, yeah, I need to hear her there. Um, one thing, though, that we do want to make clear, uh, neither Butler nor Johnson uh, had halos on their head when it came to Malcolm. And in fact, I remember Peter, Peter went into the prisons and interviewed both of them. And when he asked Butler, you know, had you been given an order? Because remember, Butler and Johnson were both part of Captain Joseph's goon squad. Yeah. And they were constantly harassing Malcolm and Malcolm's people and cracking heads here and there and stuff like that. So my point is, is that we're not talking about two men with halos on their head. Right. They were Malcolm's enemies. And at a given point, at a given time, possibly could have done what the Newark team does you know, did, you know, so I just kind of want to just keep this in some type of perspective here, you know? Right. Okay. Right. Um, before, but, before you, before you get uh, to the film, before you get ahead. to the film, because of the fact that there's a, a question in, in, in the chat, I've been getting a whole bunch of questions, but I want to deal with this one just for clarity. Um, someone asked, where does the FBI and CIA fit in uh, with this analysis and assessment? They said, I would think that they played no role at all at, uh, at Malcolm's assassination after hearing this, which I find uh, impossible to believe. Can you address that, please? Yeah. Well, actually, I think if the person had been listening closely to what I said right. earlier, then you know, you know, then I, I think you know he wouldn't have kept the the same perspective. Right. Right. And I heard you. I just wanted to repeat that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and right. I don't mind addressing it because okay. I didn't go into detail. But no let problem. me just make this real clear. Um, first off, I found no evidence of CIA involvement in Malcolm's assassination. Okay. But FBI, what, what Malcolm's case presented to the FBI and you, and, and we have to understand counterintelligence in many ways, Malcolm's assassination provided the FBI the ideal counterintelligence scheme. And when I say counterintelligence, counterintelligence mean that when organizations like the FBI, they take secretive, oftentimes illegal, immoral, unethical actions behind the scenes to manipulate and to exploit weaknesses in their target. So this is what the FBI did to help to facilitate Malcolm's assassination. They exploited 
weaknesses, problems between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X and Malcolm X and the royal family, which is Elijah Muhammad's family. And in my book, I document a series of actions. And this is what they're doing. They have wired Elijah Muhammad's homes, both the one in Phoenix and the one in Chicago, the headquarters of the Nation of Islam. They got Malcolm's house wired. They got the, you know, they got other, you know, so they're listening to everything that's going on inside these people's homes, talking in private. And I always like to use this example because it really represents how the how the enemy worked. Go back to May 1963. Elijah Muhammad is in Phoenix. He's by himself. He's sick. He's not feeling good. He's been throwing up blood. He's talking on the phone to one of his people. And he tells them, I feel like I just want to... I just feel like I want to kill myself. I feel like I'm just dying. Oh, God, you know, I'm in such pain. He says this over the phone. The FBI is listening to this. They're hearing this. This is how counterintelligence works. And then what happens here is that a series of phone calls are made to Elijah Muhammad's phone. When he answers the phone, they tell him, old man, you should kill yourself. You're worthless. Kill yourself. That's counterintelligence. And that's what they did throughout between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. They hear some of Malcolm's, um, uh, some of Elijah Muhammad's children saying something bad about, about uh, you know, you know, upset about something that Malcolm did. And then they would get informants or someone to call, the, you know, to call and continue that line of questioning to continue that type of hate. So it reaches the point in which the FBI had done their job so well that they could have just stepped to the back and the nation took over. And they appealed to Elijah Muhammad's ego. Malcolm here and there may have said something here and there that helped to, you know, Escalated. But the bottom line was that the enemy exploited weaknesses and problems within the nation and Malcolm to the point that the nation took over and said, Malcolm is a hypocrite. Malcolm deserves death. And of course, the whole baby's things made everything worse. That was that was really the real key. You know, when Malcolm started talking about the babies. Elijah Muhammad's babies, because that was the nation's Achilles heel, was the babies. Now, right. today, they're wives. They were not wives in 1964 and 1965. They were viewed as sluts in 1964 and 1965. And the nation attacked them and didn't even want to pay them child support. So when Malcolm talked about the babies in June, starting in June 1964, that's what basically turned Elijah Muhammad, that's what pushed him. So what we now know is Elijah Muhammad picked up the ball from what the enemy had been giving them, and then he finished the story. Mm. Wow. Um, that that was heavy. Uh, I want to point out one thing, and then you can, uh, you know, complete about the uh, uh, the film itself. I wanted to point out for folks who are asking about Bossy is the Bureau of Special Services um, uh, out in New York, uh, part of the NYPD. And one of the people, one of the folks who were involved with that particular uh, special unit was a cat by the name of Eugene Roberts. Eugene Roberts was at the Audubon Ballroom during the time of the assassination, but he also, he also uh, was able to infiltrate the uh, New York Black New York chapter of the Black Panther Party. Uh, by joining them later on and and working to uh, make efforts to take them to take them down. So you know, one thing about the state is they will recycle, uh, you know, their garbage and use it as many times as possible because they don't have to. Uh, they don't have to come up with new improved methods. They might tweak it a little bit, 
But again, they do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And we play right on into it as if uh, we didn't see the last trip go down. Um, I want to ask you about the uh, about the film uh, Who Killed Malcolm X? Because of the fact that uh, so many folks uh, uh, hated it. You know, we know that uh, somehow you had gotten involved. Uh, I've I've checked out some of the interviews where you explain what was what on it. But I'd like you to, if you could, just address that uh, here with, uh, you know, with our guests. Okay, yeah. Um, You know, this film, um, first off, I regret participating in the film. Um, I had no idea that that was the way that they were going to, you know, take that film. Um, I thought, uh, oh, and the other thing, I, I didn't know Skip Gates, uh, Lewis Henry Gates from, from the brothers from Harvard. I didn't know he was the producer because if I would have known he was the producer, that's all I would have needed because I don't trust, I, I wouldn't trust, that would have told me that that film wasn't going to be serious, you know, because anybody who knows Gates, you know, knows that he's only going to take this as far as it's going to benefit him. And that's the end of the story, you know. So he's not going to talk about FBI on a serious level. He's not going to talk about counterintelligence or anything like that. His focus was just on the nation. But it was more than the nation. Uh, And what they did was when they interviewed me, I talked about the nation too, because you have to talk about the nation. But I also talked about the FBI and gave detailed stuff. They, They deleted, they wouldn't, they didn't share none of that. Because hmm. all they wanted to do was to just use it as a club to go after the nation. You know, that's what they wanted to do. And they succeeded, basically, I think, in doing that. But Malcolm's assassination was much more complex than just the nation of Islam. You know, but, you know, and you have to talk about, in, in other words, you cannot talk about Malcolm's assassination hmm. without talking about the FBI. You can't. You're playing games if you do. And also Balsy, the Bureau of Special Service. They did do a little bit, I thought, on Balsy, but that was it. You know, they could have they could have been much more serious had they wanted to be, but they didn't want to be. This film, by the way, wasn't about necessarily putting out, putting out the truth. I will say this, you know, the whole emphasis on Butler and Johnson's innocence and stuff, uh, which which they made it seem as though Muhammad, you know, was the one who, who, I mean, I mean, it's, that was absurd. The storyline of that film is, is absurd. You know, to try to focus on this lone uh, crusader trying to solve Malcolm's assassination because he was dissatisfied. It's an absurd. Anybody who knows anything about that, about Malcolm's assassination world knows that that, that that's absurd. All of that was absurd. And again, I didn't know that. And I didn't know. And and so, you know, when they were talking about doing a second one from Jump Street, and in fact, I think I said publicly, don't even, you know, lose my damn number. I have no interest whatsoever wow. in participating in anything, you know, in 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 the part two version of that facade. No doubt. There you have it, folks. Um, Baba. Baba Zach, we appreciate you coming on. Um, hopefully you can leave us with, uh, with with three of the best books that you think we should uh, get to uh, in, in regards to uh, Malcolm. If you have that time, if not, we understand. But we definitely appreciate you coming on and joining us today on Rise Star the TV and Black Power Media. You know, it's okay. definitely a possibility. So you said three, three books? Three, five, whatever you can do. <laughs> best. <laughs> okay, well, you know. certainly any book that Peter... Any book that Peter Bailey said, you know, wrote needs to be out there. Peter Goodman's book, the uh, p- but uh, particularly uh, the second volume, uh, I I haven't gotten to the third volume. Un- understand there's a third volume, but I'm going to get to that. Certainly, um, yeah. the autobiography of Malcolm X. Malcolm X speaks, you know, because nobody you know can do better than Malcolm's, you know, hear Malcolm's voice, get Malcolm's, you know, speeches himself, and of course. When my new book comes out, certainly I, I would I would highly recommend you know my uh, my book on Malcolm's assassination. This this should be my last one 
on Malcolm X. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, to kind of put all of this stuff on the table and uh, wait for the next generation, if they need to go there, to add to as far as the assassination is concerned. Well, we're looking forward to bringing you on when that when the new book drops. So, again, we appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day. You know what I mean? I've been trying to contact you for months and, you know, come to find out I was texting the wrong number. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Well, some... it, was, it was an honor uh, being here and I yes, appreciate the work, you know, that the network does. And 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 I'm just proud that you you know, that the younger generation are doing these types of things. So I commend this whole structure. You know, this is this is what our people need. And just keep keep doing what you're doing. Hey, we appreciate you, Baba. And our network is your network. Stay on top of the world. And we're going to see you in a few ticks. You've been, um, you know, it's been, been a pleasure. It's been an honor. You've been Thank checking you, out. Yes, sir. You've been checking out Baba Zach Kondo right here on Riot Starter TV. I mean, that was fire. What y'all think, man? I mean, I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, th this is this was a heavy joint. I learned a lot. A lot of the stuff I've uh, um, I've heard through checking out his interviews and, and you know, a lot of it was 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 new. So, you know, that's always beautiful and it's always refreshing. We want to keep on bringing you this type of content because of the fact that we love us. And we want to make sure that we're on the right side of the barricades and we want folks to hear things from the horse's mouth. We don't want to speculate. We want to break things down. We're not doing this to make ourselves look good. We want to do this to make sure that we are uh, on, on the right side of things. So we appreciate you all for checking us out. I ask of you two things. One, uh, actually three. One, to uh, subscribe, like and uh, share the channel but also to share this particular episode of Riot Starter TV and make sure you check out the archives. We appreciate all that you do for us. We have a whole lot of great programming coming up uh, this weekend. First and foremost, check out I Mix What I Like tomorrow morning with Dr. Jared Ball, uh, my, my, my homie and hater in charge. Uh, uh, and <laughs> he'll be uh, rocking tomorrow morning from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Also, we have... Um, uh, my 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 sister and um uh rebel in charge jacqueline um jackie luke mon you can check out her show tomorrow uh right here on riot starter tv i'm excuse me right here on black riot starter tv right here on black power media as well um i don't have the time on deck i believe it's 5 p.m she's in the chat she can let you know and um on sunday excuse me saturday we have uh, Warriors class at 1 p.m. But make sure you just check out all that we do Sundays on Sunday and we'll be back to remix. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Remix morning show next week. Love and appreciation. Stay ready for revolution. Support our work. Make sure you join the organization. We out.